Yeah, good question. So I don't think any of the black women that I know of became promoters, but some of the, most of them kind of retired and went on to second careers. Ethel, I think, just be kind of became like a full-time mother after she retired. Ramona, as I said, she became a, I don't, I don't remember if that was in the clip or not. She became, she went to work for the Ohio Bureau of, Bureau of Workers' Compensation. Um, Marva, uh, Ethel's young, youngest sister, she actually became um, a youth counselor at this place that used to exist called Tico. It was like, um, you know, the juvenile detention center. So she would, she would um, go wrestle on the weekend. So she would kind of do it part time. Actually, Mildred Burke, she actually moved to Los Angeles after she divert, divorced Billy Wolf and she started her own wrestling promotion business. Actually, and another wrestler named Moolah, she started her own wrestling uh, business. She was from, I think I want to say South Carolina. And there was actually recently um, a Vice News um, uh, story about Moolah and how, like Billy Wolf, <coughs> Moolah was like, she empowered women, but she also exploited women. And there was, a, there was another famous black, or black female wrestler named Sweet Georgia Brown, and she was represented by Moolah. And Sweet Georgia Brown's um, adult children, were, who are biracial, were saying that we don't know what was going on with Moolah, but it was more than wrestling because our mom would go away on these wrestling trips and she would come back impregnated. And it was like, excuse my French, but it's like Moolah seemed to be pimping the women out. You know, she, so I don't know how much of that went on in the wrestling business. But so those are two examples of two of the white women who went on to be promoters. As far as I know, none of the black women started their own wrestling promotion business, but you're right about kind of history, kind of being selective. And part of it, as I said, the women themselves have been kind of secretive about it. But also I think in general, you know, I don't think it can be argued that women's stories are not elevated as much as men. You don't see women's sports even to this day on TV as much as you see men's. You don't see, you know, with the exception of a handful, you don't really know, women athletes are not household names the way that men are. So I think it's just that um, his, historians probably thought, number one, wrestling is fake and we're not going to champion these women that were part of something that we consider fake. And then number two, women's history and black women's history is not something that society in general really champions. You know, Therefore you have stories like hidden figures that just completely vanish into thin air until somebody decides to you know, shine a light on it. Some more questions, comments, or? So I'll share with you, so as I was working on this over the years, so technology kept changing while I was working on this. So when I started working on it, like mini DV, which is like, you know, mini like um, cassette, basically that you would record on, that was like the, the standard. And then it, it moved to like um, SD cards. So it's like I have all these like hours and hours of interviews on different formats. And some of them it's like if you play the tape, the tape will start crunching, you know, because it's just like the, the tape is so old and it's been sitting around for a while. So, you know, trying to pres preserve a lot of that stuff is kind of a challenge too. And editing on different systems. Like I started, I started out editing on Final Cut, which has become obsolete. So I had to, when I started um, doing the post-production at the Wexler Center, they, they transferred it to Avid, which is like a more um, kind of advanced, sophisticated system. Um, and even Avid is sort of like, now everybody's like moving to Premiere. So that was kind of, and I, I, don't, I don't have a, I'm not a, I never went to film school. My degree's in English. So like kind of learning the technologies I went along, that was kind of a challenge. And also finding um, people to like give some context. I don't believe he was in the, um, the clip I showed you, but there's a, an Ohio State black, um, black studies professor named Hassan Jeffries. His brother, um, Hakeem, is actually a congressman. So he actually gave the historical perspective of, of how um, unique these women are. But he was actually not my first choice to be a, a commentator in the documentary. There's this, and I'm not going to say her name because this is kind of a, a negative experience. So there's this woman. I wanted a voice of a woman uh, to kind of give historical context. So there's this famous or somewhat famous black female cultural commentator who I met at a Martin Luther King event um, at Wittenberg University. And when I told her I was working on this story, she was like, oh my God, that sounds amazing. Um, come interview me um, at, at my house in, in, in DC and I'll give you all the information you need and I'm so glad you're doing this story. So, you know, I have a day job, so I had to take a day off work, drove all the way to Washington DC, you know, 11 hour drive um, with all this camera equipment and stuff. So I get out of the car and check my phone. There's this email from her saying, 
I'm sorry, I have a conference to prepare for. She's a, she's a um, college professor. She's like, I have a conference to prepare for. I'm not going to be able to do the interview. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, no, she did. I'm, I'm not going to say what I actually <laughs> said to myself. But. So I called her and I was like, you know, do you even have 15 minutes? You know, I'll be in and out of your hair. You know, I drove all the way from Columbus, Ohio. I hate driving through mountains. I mean, the whole way there was nothing but with mountains. And she's like, I'm sorry, I have this conference in Haiti I have to get ready for. We'll do it some other time. And she kept, like, she ghosted me, basically. Like, I, I would email her. She wouldn't, she wouldn't reply. Um, I, I'd call, you know, leave a message. She'd never call back. So I forget how I found Hassan, but um, so I went to Hassan's office. I, I gave him just a real, real, real quick overview of what the topic was. He didn't know anything about women's wrestling either. He just talked about black history in general. And I mean, in 20 minutes in his office, he summed up the whole history of black women in society, how these women were unique, of how black men have this history of like being kind of like migrant workers where they go work for like, you know, two weeks somewhere and then come back home. And he was saying these women were sort of like taking the place of the men by doing this work um, all in 20 minutes. And, you know, so it sort of worked out, even though that woman, you know, she, and it, what was weird was like, um, like a couple years after she just kind of completely disappeared, I get this notice that she's following me on Twitter. And it's just weird. So, yeah, that's, that's one of the strange things that happened during the making of this. All right, well, thank you guys for watching. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, James, again, for inviting me. <coughs> Appreciate it. Thank you.